my parents are brilliant. You know, they brought me up. This is, I am what I am because of them. They were just supporting me in everything I wanted to do. You know, they think too much about the schooling, but they thought, they knew I wasn't gonna do it. So there was no point. So just get on with what you're doing. You know, they fed me, they clothed me. He was all happy because there were six kids. It's like when they, the back door was in the original place there next to the sink. If I was going in and out one day and she said, look, stop going in and out the door, I'm busy. So she'd done it once and she smashed a plate on my head. You know, but it was, it was funny, it was hilarious. You know, that'll teach you, look. <laughs> To this day now, everybody says, I'm so much like my mother. Not to look at, my mother was five foot four, um, and um, I don't look like her at all. But I've, I've got so much of my mother's personality. Um, she was a feisty woman, um, not afraid to say what she felt. Um, and I've taken that from her. Even at her funeral, I remember my brother saying, God, you're so much like mum. She, she's had a tough life, my mum. She lost three children before having me. One was born and lived for a day, and two were still born. She was a <clears throat> hard, independent working woman. She brought me up, basically, to take no shit off anyone. She was funny, she was witty, she was strong. I remember an occasion um, when my brother was a about nine or ten years old, um, we had a shop on the corner, um, and in the shop they had um, a bandit machine, which obviously you're not supposed to use until you're 18. But my brother and his friends had been in there putting their money in for about an hour. They put a fair few quid in there, and the guy in the shop hadn't said a word until they won. And then he said, You can't have that money, you're not supposed to be playing on the machine. So my brother being my brother had something to say. He was got you know, got a bit gobby with him. And the the fella physically pushed him out of the shop. My brother fell over, hurt himself. I happened to be walking past. My brother's there crying, what's wrong? Uh, so he told me, so I went home and told my mum. And she just got up, walked out of the house, down to the shop. There was a queue of people. Just pushed past everybody, walked up to him, grabbed hold of his beard, dragged him across the counter and said, you touch my son again and I'll kill you. Let go and walked out of the shop. <laughs> That's the type of woman my mother was. She always used to, you know, tell me funny stories about a man who'd lost his legs. And my mother hadn't realised that um, it was her first shift there and he said to her, can you find me my slippers? She was over an hour looking for his slippers, but he had no legs. So she always used to say, you know, funny stories about that. And um, she loved it, absolutely loved it. The funny thing is, mum, mum was diagnosed at 59. Um, and she'd had a nickname for years in the family as Alzheimer's Annie, because she never had a good memory, never. Um, it was like, you know, going one ear and up the other. And I could never remember anything. But I would say a couple of years, possibly three years before she was diagnosed, so she would have only been in her mid-50s. Um, things were obviously getting worse, in as much as um, she'd help out with, with my daughter, uh, picking her up from school, and, and um, she had to keep writing things down, you know, like what day she was picking her up and what time, because she knew she'd forget. I see Nan on the Friday on my way home from work, lunchtime. And I said, right, now I'll pick you up in the morning to go and see Bamba, because Bamba was in a care home at the time. I got there Saturday and she's speaking absolute nonsense. We was driving along and she said, oh, that's nice. Did you see the moon up there then? And, you know, the man in the moon said, I'm going. So, I rang Nan 
and said, go down the bungalow, pick up some clothes, be taking mum down the hospital. The first time I realised something was wrong was my mother became incredibly distant. She loved her grandkids, she, her two boys as she called them, um, but there were times where I'd say, oh, is it okay if we call up to see you? And she was like, I don't want to see anybody. So I used to call up to see her and her house was immaculate. Everything was in its place. And then I started noticing that the house started to become untidy. And there was lots of notes everywhere that she was making to herself. Lots of um, uh, money that she'd taken out of the bank, she'd written down. And then she was doing lots of figures, working out stuff. And I just thought, oh, this is a bit strange. But I, I just didn't think anything of it. And I used to tease her, oh, mum, you're losing your marbles. And then there's that point where you think to yourself, she's lost her marbles and you think and it's a horrible thing to say but you you hit that realization that something is really wrong when we got to the hospital we found out she'd had a stroke and but it was a stroke was on the front of the brain so all her limbs was fine nothing this and that but it brought on dementia and I remember having a phone call from her supervisor in work and she said, oh, hi, Ruth. And I remember saying to what I know, I know what you're going to say. She'd been making mistakes in work. And she worked as a phlebotomist. So <clears throat> she worked with needles and she'd left needles on the patient's bed. And I just knew <clears throat> that whatever fears I had had just been confirmed by other people. She didn't know who she was, where she was, what she was doing. Didn't know me. Well, didn't know anybody. And ever since then, it's been... Well, it's sad. It's really sad to watch somebody to go from one day being able to do a crossword in five minutes, any words, anything like that, to nothing. I was with mum because I used to take her to the hospital for her appointments. There was no doubt in my mind that she had some form of dementia. So it was a bit of a relief to actually get a diagnosis, naively thinking that there would be something that could help. I honestly thought she's 59, she's got Alzheimer's, we've still got years and years and years before she gets to a point where she's not mum anymore. It wasn't until they described frontal lobe dementia and the way it affects people, you know, it's so degenerative. I mean, I still visit her every week because she's in a care home now. And uh, you can see she's trying to tell you something, but she doesn't know how to. She was there the other week because she was having a bit of a cry and this and that. So I was cuddling her and you know, so I said to her, why are you so sad? Come on, man, why are you so sad? And she went, I don't know. It was worse for Bamper when Bamper was alive because they were in separate care homes. She could never go to see him because she just, she got a fear now of transport and stuff like that. And you take her out of her comfort zone and she's shot. I. I went through a range of, of emotions. I wasn't particularly easy to live with at that point. Um, I just remember being angry, really angry. You know, why her? She's lost three children. You know, she left my dad. She'd, she'd been through so much in her life that she didn't deserve this. She didn't deserve it at all. 
and I just remember feeling numb and angry and I wasn't a very nice person. I was horrible to people because I was so angry. Because she didn't deserve this. Within six to twelve months of her being diagnosed, it was obvious that she needed she couldn't be left on alone alone for long periods of time. So dad working all day. It couldn't happen. She she was alright for an hour or so in front of the TV, but she couldn't be left. She'd forget to eat um quite quickly, you know, she unless you were there with her eating, she'd just forget to eat. And she went from a woman who showered twice my mother smoked but hated the smelling of smoke and hated anybody knowing that she smoked. So she'd shower every morning and every night. She would not even open the front door to the postman without a full face of makeup on. She would dress inappropriately. Her clothing wouldn't match with, at one point, you know, she was, she was always immaculate. And then she was wearing outfits that were just like, you know, out of context with the season. Um, her, she was incredibly rude. That filter, that part of the brain that would say, right, you think it, but you're not going to say it, had gone. And she was immensely rude to people. And basically, she couldn't function anymore. She couldn't, she couldn't make a cup of tea, forgotten how to make toast. We had to take the keys off her because she'd forgotten how to drive. I remember when she caused like a two mile tail back because she forgot how to put the car in first gear. So dad always had to go and see her and you could, she, well I expect she'd done it to all the family that, after five minutes she'd just say I'm going to bed and off she'd go. There's nothing you could do about it. I go now and she knows I'm, a, I'm her son but she doesn't know my name. She knows me because she smiles and she keeps hold of my hand but other than that I don't think she got a clue. Um, she she knew me. She didn't know I was a daughter at this point. I used to take her, there's um, a day centre in Barry that's for people with young onset dementia. They've got a coffee shop there and everything. And I'd take her up there and she'd tell everybody there that I was a friend. Um, which was fine, you know. Um, she remembered my name. Um, but she, she told everybody that her one regret in life was that she never had kids. And obviously she did, she had two. Um, and then things started to take a turn when she was falling down the stairs a lot. She just had um, a shunt fitted to drain the fluid off her brain. But something went horribly wrong. And I remember her telling me one day that um, when I went to visit, the dad had asked her to marry him. I'd been married 45 years. I got in contact with the council because there was old age bungalows um, up, by my, up by me. So um, we managed to get her into an old age bungalow, which was a one bedroom bungalow. So I thought, right, she's safe. The first night that she moved into the bungalow, um, she came down my house at two o'clock in the morning, wearing um, a bikini, a sun hat, and a pair of Crocs with socks. Um, wanting to use my toilet um, so goes and she just barged in the house she woke us up the dogs were barking so we, we got up and we looked at her going where are you going and she's like I'm using your toilet and we were like well you got a toilet in your house she said yeah but I want to use yours and of course that's when we thought oh god things are really really bad so uh, we got in contact with social services who came in and assessed her basically to see um you know, how she was functioning, how, you know, her day-to-day -day life, uh, whether she could wash herself, clean herself. And it was at that point that they made a decision that she needed to go into a home. I don't know how people would manage looking after somebody with dementia. It must be terrible. 
Uh, luckily for us, mum's best friend for many, many years um, decided to come on board and help uh, as a job. She gave up her, her job and through a charity she was taken on to be mum's mum's carer for 30 hours a week, which allowed dad to just, you know. He said it was nice to just go and have a bath in peace without having to worry what my mum was doing. When she, when we first moved her into the home, we made the room up beautiful. I bought pictures, I bought photos, I stuck photos all over the walls, just for her, you know, to, so she didn't feel alone. She still had pictures, she still had familiar, familiarity with her surroundings. The last 12 months were, she couldn't speak at all, nothing. I mean, noise was coming out, but there was, there was no words. And within a week, I had a phone call from the home manager to say that she'd ripped all the wallpaper off in her room. She'd taken the borders off in the hall. And basically, she'd ripped the curtains down in the seating area and thrown them out the window. Basically, anything that they gave my mother went out the window. Woke up at two o'clock in the morning um, and fell down the stairs. And she broke her neck and broke her back and got rushed into hospital. I don't think they actually know in their own minds what the hell's going on. They've got their own thoughts and this and that. And they're totally different to what is really happening. I knew my mum was dying because ultimately her... She'd started to lose her swallowing reflex. Um, she couldn't support her body. She was sitting in a special chair, which almost scooped her up. She, um, she had no quality of life. She was dying. And I remember going to visit her Christmas Day. And the one thing that my mother did react to, if anything, was music. So I remember her buying her little portable CD player and headphones. And I remember putting her favourite music on and there was no response. So she ended up um, being moved from the Heath when they had healed her neck to St David's Hospital um, purely to die, to starve to death. Mum used to... Um, the one thing she could do was pull the tubes out. She didn't understand why I was there. The tube could be in for a few days or a few weeks. Um, but fitting the tubes again wasn't a particularly pleasant process. And there was only certain people that can do it. Do you know, because it's like with the experience from that, and she doesn't actually know anything. You know, you ask her, what did you have for breakfast? Now, I might go there an hour after breakfast. She couldn't tell you. She knows she's had breakfast, but what it was. I remember being in the shower boxing day and my partner, Ricky, runs up the stairs and says, we've got to go to the hospital. Um, your mother's arrested. She got moved on the Monday and I went in to see her on the Tuesday. And she'd pulled the tube out the Monday night, so she'd not been there 24 hours and she'd pulled the tube out. And it was just too soon um, for Dad. The tube comes out and they fit you with a tube to give you saline so at least you're not dehydrated. And then after a few days, when you're still not eating, they say, it's not happening, basically. Um, so they take the saline tube out and you die of thirst. I don't really remember Ricky driving me to the hospital at all. It's all a big blur. I just remember being grabbed by some nurses who obviously knew me because I work in the hospital. And I remember j just saying, as she, she died, as she died, because my biggest worry was that she would have died alone or in a manner that you know wasn't how I how I imagined the end to be. And um, I remember them saying to me, you know, listen your mum's seriously ill and they were talking to me about turning the life support machine off and I instantly, instantly said turn it off 
let me have a bit of time with her but we turn it off because for me she wouldn't have wanted to go on I didn't want her to go on because she had no life she was suffering so I got to the hospital got in sat next to her it was me my dad and my brother um, and within 20 minutes she was she was gone but I like to think that she waited for us all to be there all three of us to get there I remember holding her in my arms. I remember singing to her our favourite songs. She used to love You Are My Sunshine. We she, we were singing all sorts of things. Things, you know, stuff that we used to do when we were kids. We used to talk, you know, about everything. Everything about happy times. And I just told her, you know, it's okay to go. It is okay to go. And I'll just never forget just looking at her. And she just went. At half past three in the afternoon, she just went, she took her last breath and whatever made her, her had gone, whatever she was had gone. I had an unbelievable amount of support from my best friend and from her younger sister, uh, Sheila. Um, without them and my kids, basically, um, and my partner, I wouldn't have been able to get through this. My work colleagues were fantastic, but did I really get much help from, you know, the community? You know, I cried for help with people, um, got in contact with you know, anybody who could help me understand what was going on. And on the face of it, you, you there is support, but I don't think there's much support for people with dementia and their families. I don't think there's enough for, for the families. I think they concentrate so much on the person that is suffering. And I think then on the wise of what's going on, it's the family that needs that need the support. Yeah, the hospital were awful if I'm honest it was you've got Alzheimer's go away come back in six months nothing and you've got to be quite hard faced to be able to visit and that because some people just couldn't do it I would expect because I've seen people in a care home she had dead just on our visitors my my ultimate thing is that I never want my kids to see me go through what my mother went through my youngest is five I'm 45. If I turn into my mother, um, she's going to be less than 20 when I get, if I get, was to get this disease. And, you know, there's a strong possibility that, you know, my grandfather, her father had dementia, my mum's had dementia, you know, the chances of me getting dementia is pretty high. I want to enjoy them and I want them to be able to enjoy me. I just pray to God if I ever reach that stage that there is more um, things in place for people with dementia than what my mother had because it wasn't enough. It wasn't enough. <laughs>